Hey, people of faith, Pastor Daniel here for our Easter sunrise sermon on Easter Sunday, March the 31st, 2024. This is the beginning of a four-part sermon series titled C. It's there. The it kind of changes every time. Uh, the evidence will be our first one and then the truth and we'll go on from there. This is our sunrise sermon and we're going to begin all of these. We'll be, begin with John 20 verses 1 through 10. All four of these sermons are coming from John chapter 20 where we will be for the next three weeks. This morning the sunrise verses 1 through 10 and then at our traditional service it will be verses 11 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. Early on, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken away the Lord, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks so much for your word, your word who is Jesus the Christ, your word who is the Holy Spirit who is in our midst. Lord, we give you thanks so much for your word that is the sharing of the faith and your word that is the Holy Scriptures that we've read before us. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we speak now and as we listen now, that it may all come from your word. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. And amen. For this first sermon on Easter Sunday, I want to take us all back to our school days and see how much we remember. Do you remember the scientific method? You know, the scientific method is uh, you, you've got an idea about something, you have a thought about a subject, and so you go and you do research on the subject. You go and see what has everyone written about, what's been known about this subject. And if you have an idea about it, or, you know, if then, if I do this, then this will happen. If, if nobody's written about it, then you can come up with a hypothesis, which is the, if I do this, then this will happen. And then after the hypothesis, you, uh, you create a test and you test your hypothesis. And if it's true, well, then you can publish that. If, if it comes that, you know, the, the, the test supports your hypothesis, you can publish that so that other scientists can then test your work. And if it happens repeatedly, then it is no longer a theory. If, it, if, if the test supports the hypothesis, you have yourself kind of a theory there. Now, there is a difference between a theory and a hypothesis. A theory happens kind of, I would say, uh, absent from reality as we currently know it. A theory is something that has been tested but has not been quite proven to be true. And uh, if you think, you might think about the theory of evolution, which I would say is pretty much got no support for the theory of evolution. I'm kind of against the theory of evolution. I don't think there's a lot of support there. You might think about the Big Bang Theory. And just about a year or so ago, we got the, the latest, the, the newest pictures from the deepest pictures of space before. And those pictures found that the stars were not still being formed. And those pictures really uh, made the Big Bang Theory take a big hit on its credibility. So even the Big Bang Theory isn't quite looking like anything that's going to be true. It's a theory. It's not truth. It hasn't been proven to be true. How about... Newton's law of gravity. 
The law of gravity was a theory, but it's been proven to be true. Therefore, it's a law. It is truth. Science wants to seek truth. I think we all want to seek truth. And during this Easter series, I hope even every Easter sermon, we realize who truth is. Now, I've got a confession to make and just hold on. Bear with me here. There are different gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of faith. I don't have that gift. I don't have the gift of just having blind faith and accepting based upon the word. I am Mr. Logical. I want things to make sense. I had to rationalize in my head faith so that I have faith. I actually felt Jesus and I had rationalized, well, is this really Jesus that I'm feeling? I, I feel the Holy Spirit convicting me. I felt drawn to pray and accept him as my Lord and Savior, confess my sins and receive that forgiveness. But I still had some stuff in my head that I needed to figure out. While I'm saying this to you, I also want to combat something you've possibly heard by preachers before, because I've heard preachers before say it's not okay to doubt. You have to have complete faith. You can't doubt a single thing. Well, we do need to have complete faith in God, but it's okay that we doubt. He accepts us as we are, Jesus does, and he still challenges us to go further. Take Simon Peter, for example. Not in this scripture that we just read, but in the book of Acts, we find Peter preaches the sermon on the, uh, at, on the day of Pentecost. All the disciples are filled with the Spirit, and it is Simon Peter who stands up and preaches. And thousands of people come to be saved. Simon heals people in the name of Jesus. Simon helps, Simon Peter helps to lead and start the church. And yet, he doubted the resurrection. He didn't have complete faith. We see this here in our scripture. He didn't quite believe. We find at the end of our scripture here that, that John believed. And I want, to under, I want to break some of that down for us all in a little bit. But I want to jump ahead to the next chapter real quick. John chapter 21. Peter and the other disciples are fishing. And they see someone on the shore, and Peter hears that it's Jesus, so he jumps in the water and swims ashore to Jesus. And what he finds is Jesus is there, already making everybody some breakfast and with fish and bread, which is basically fish tacos. <laughs> and Peter hears Jesus restore him. Peter had denied Jesus three times, so Jesus restores Peter with these three questions. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? Every time, Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Jesus responds, feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, take care of them. But there's something more. It's the word love that is used. We're going to talk about Greek a little bit, some Greek words this morning. The word that is used for Jesus saying to Peter, do you love me? The first time is agape. Now there's four different types of love in the Greek language. And the top one is agape. This is God's unconditional love for us. So Jesus says to Peter, do you love me no matter what? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. Peter comes back with the phileo love, which isn't as much as the agape love. It's a step down. And Jesus says, okay, Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. I'm still going to send you, but I want to know, do you agape me? Do you love me no matter what? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, okay. What do you think happens the third time? Does Jesus ask agape again? And does Peter finally go up to that next step? No. Jesus has already found out where Peter is at. And Jesus says the third time, fine. You don't agape me, Peter. Do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you like a brother. Jesus still sends him out. It's not just John, the gospel writer, who tells us this. Matthew 2 tells us that the, when the disciples see Jesus after the resurrection, some still doubted, and yet he still sends us. Jesus sends us in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of us trying to come up with scientific theories and scientific methods to figure out how this all works out. It's okay to be wherever you are, whether you're at the phileo love 
and not at the agape love or wherever you are in the journey of faith, Jesus still calls us and he also sends us to live for him. Peter would go on to receive the Spirit, to preach thousands of people, to bring many, many people to Jesus, to heal people in the name of Jesus, to baptize people in the name of Jesus. Jesus still sent him. So wherever you are, it's okay where you are. Jesus still wants us. He still sends us. In this sermon series, it is C. I want us to have our eyes open. And here in our scripture, we find with Peter and John, Three different words in the Greek language for the word see. There's a lot of words in the Greek language for the word see. The gospel according to John mainly uses three, and each of those three are actually found here in this chapter. First, we find as John and Peter are running to the tomb, because Mary came and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So they're probably afraid that there's been some grave robbers, because grave robbery was not an uncommon thing back then. So Peter and John take off running. John outruns them because John, more than likely, John is younger. Some argue that Peter's like 20 years old. I would think Peter's closer to Jesus's age, about 30 years old, perhaps. John is definitely like, it's, it's kind of consensus. John's the youngest apostle. Some argue that he was as young as 12 when Jesus called him, which means he had been about 15 about this time. And that could be the case. He could be 20 at this time, but he's definitely a lot younger than Peter. So he outruns Peter to the tomb. And when he gets there, we find he looks in the tomb and he sees the linen cloths lying there. Now let's go back to our scientific method. There's a testing that needs to happen. And from the testing, you look at the results, the evidence and then you come away with a conclusion. So John gets there and looks, and the word here in Greek is blepo, which is where we get the word blip. He, he sees a blip of what's in the tomb. And what he sees is the linen cloths, which makes sense because if you read chapter 19, we find Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus brought with them about a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloe to prepare the body for Jesus, wrapped it in linen cloths, and laid them in the tomb. Then we have here John saying, well, there's the linen cloths. His body's still there. For some reason, the tomb, the stone has been rolled away. Simon Peter comes along, catching up to John, and he just ducks right into the tomb. And when he does, we find this. He sees or he saw, excuse me, Peter saw the strips of linen lying there, the same thing that John saw. And then verse seven, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus's head and the cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Now the NIV, I think, does a, a pretty poor job at translating this kind of Easter sun, this, this first Easter morning uh, story from John 20. It's more like it was folded. That cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head, it was folded and separated from the linen, lying in a separate place. And it says that Peter saw, not blepo, but theoreo, which is where we get the word theorize from. Peter is thinking. He's coming up with a theory, maybe a hypothesis. He is thinking, wait a moment, there's more evidence. Not only is the linen here, which makes sense, but the, the part that was covering his head, it's, it's folded up. It's rolled up nicely and neatly and, and placed. And that, by the way, is a sign I will come back. That's a sign that Jesus is coming back. And Peter's puzzled here. He's, he's got this theory kind of going on in his mind. What is going on? Then we have John coming back in. John comes into the tomb. All it says is he saw and he believed. First, he just saw a little bit of the evidence. There's some linen lying there. And then he saw that the linen wasn't really covering the body of Jesus. It was just there. And not only that, but the part that was wrapped around his head was folded up and separated from the rest. This word here for he saw, it's not blepo, it's not a little blip. 
It's not theoreto, it's not a it's not a theory, it's hara'o. Hara'o is something that you see spiritually deep inside. It's like you see kind of everything and understand. It says he saw and believed, and then hear this again. I would say that the NIV does a, a rather poor job on translating verse 9. The NIV says, they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. What was probably the better translation is, for as yet they did not understand. For up to this point, they did not understand that Jesus should rise from the dead. But now John gets it. Now John understands the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now a light bulb has come on and John sees the whole pictures, the, the whole picture of, of what Jesus was talking about. Oh, this is what Jesus meant when he said, I must die and three days later be rise from the dead. This is what Jesus meant. I finally get it now. That word horao, we have, it doesn't, the word horoscope in English comes from a similar word, which means hour in Greek, horo and scopus. But I wonder if, because horoscopes, and I wouldn't encourage anybody to look into horoscopes too much, but horoscopes, they're, the, the whole basis of them is the whole universe, if you look at everything in its magnitude all together, then you can kind of find some truth to yourself. Well, just take that basic principle. John, horao, this seeing here that we're talking about is seeing the big picture, all of the Bible together and realizing, wow, Jesus came, taught me how to live the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And I've been blowing it. Not only that, but, but we blew it at the beginning because we didn't like the way he taught us to live the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So we killed him for it. And he loved us so much that he didn't even fight us on that. He bore our sins on the cross, being faithful to God, even to the point of death. And God raised him up from the grave. All of this, the big scope of things, all for us. So that we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. So that we can live with him forevermore. And so that we can live with him here and now. Living for Jesus. Easter Sunday means the end of Lent season, which is a, a season of repentance. And this season is not something I should, I would encourage you guys just to make a seasonal thing, repenting. It should be a daily thing. We should every day try to improve on ourselves, give something up for Jesus, take something extra on for Jesus. If you gave up coffee like I did, don't tomorrow try to drink 20 cups of coffee to make up for what you've missed in the previous 46 days. No, just cut back. Don't ever get back to the point where you drink four cups of coffee in a day. Limit it to two or something. If you've been reading a daily devotional, don't just all of a sudden get it up. No, don't just give it up. Just continue doing the daily devotionals. These are part of living lives of repentance. See, the whole scope of Christianity is that God sent Jesus to teach us how to live. And he died on the cross and he rose from the grave so that we may be filled with his spirit and we may truly live life to the fullest. So go forth from here. See the evidence that's there. It's not just in the grave, the linens and the, fold, and the folded linens that are, were, were upon his head are now there. But see the evidence in your life of how God has moved. See the evidence of how God has moved in other people's lives. See the evidence that Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. He is risen from the grave. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. See the evidence is there. Believe in the gospel and live for Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Amen.